Hello and welcome. Jack Staff is a series entirely written and illustrated by Paul Grist. It began as a self-published black and white series before moving to Image Comics and becoming an ongoing color series. Jack Staff is a highly entertaining comic book. It's set within one location, the fictional city of Castletown, and contains a vast supporting cast that fills out this solitary landscape. It succeeds in telling a solid story, utilizing well-defined characters working through a challenging situation. It's neither grim nor gritty, nor does it present heavy moral conflicts disguised as a transparent discussion of current social issues. The lack of pretense is infinitely charming, all of which makes Jack Staff sound a little shallow. However, there is a complex good versus evil saga hidden just below the surface. This slowly reveals itself over time and comes to a temporary conclusion in what would be the penultimate issue of the series. Unfortunately, a highly erratic publishing schedule mixed with a unique storytelling method and a cartoonish art style led to low sales and the series was discontinued in 2011. So, any further developments of that saga have gone unexplored. A popular misconception about the series is it is a reworked Union Jack proposal that Paul Grist pitched to Marvel Comics in the 90s. As explained by Grist, he had an idea for a Union Jack story and he made an inquiry to see if Marvel might be interested, but nothing happened beyond one phone call. However, the vague story idea stayed with Grist and he decided to write it out using original characters. This led to the story printed in the first four black and white issues of the Jack Staff series. With that in mind, it's hard not to see some characters as direct analogs for other Marvel characters. For example, Jack Staff himself looks like a redesigned Union Jack. Sergeant States is clearly a version of Captain America, and Blazing Glory does bear a resemblance to the Human Torch. So, at a glance, these characters do appear to be a disguised version of the Invaders. However, they are all unique and distinct. At best, the Invaders could be considered an early inspiration. Stylistically, Jack Staff is based on British adventure comics, but filtered through a modern sensibility. So the story is broken up and serialized in short segments, focusing on various characters at various points during the story. In other words, the story feels somewhat fractured and non-linear. At the same time, it also feels quite organic once one adapts to the storytelling method. It's analogous to watching a Shakespearean play. After about 10 minutes, one gets used to the flow and rhythm of the dialogue, and they can settle in and enjoy the spectacle. The comic also pays homage to classic British adventure heroes, although practically all of these references will go unnoticed by a North American audience. Not picking up on these parallels doesn't negatively impact the characters themselves. They are simply interesting details for one to notice if they are so inclined. To give a sense of how frenetic one issue can be, these are the plot beats within the first issue of the Color series. The story opens on Malone, the commander of Project Hurricane. He's informed that Weapon H has escaped and is headed towards Castletown. This cuts to a fight scene between Jack Staff and an unnamed brute. Presumably, he's the aforementioned Weapon H. As it turns out, these two opening scenes occurred 20 years in the past. This cuts to modern times and begins with three sequential splash pages that introduce Tom Tom the Robot Man, the villain Shock, and Commander Hawks. These three characters have a brief fight. Q, the question mark crimes division, is then introduced. They are on scene and investigating a strange murder. We also briefly meet the hard-nosed, old-fashioned copper, Detective Inspector Maverick, who doesn't approve of Q and their methods. Becky Burdock, vampire reporter, is rescued by John Smith when he notices something falling from the sky. John Smith is, secretly, Jack Staff, who decides to investigate the hole the falling object created. Detective Inspector Maverick is then highlighted, along with Detective Sergeant Nolan. They discover a pattern to a series of rage attacks happening in Castletown. We return to Jack Staff investigating the hole with Becky Burdock. Here they run across Shock and Tom Tom, who were the mysterious falling object that nearly hit Becky. Tom Tom seems possessed and launches into the sky. This creates a hole that collapses on Becky and Jack. For those keeping count, two timelines and 12 different characters are introduced in 26 pages, which is a fair amount to digest in one issue. Narratively, there is a seamless blend of limited omniscient narration mixed with first person perspective, depending on which character is in focus. In other words, there is a variety of voices telling the story, which simultaneously explores both the plot and reveals traits of the active character. 
One aspect that keeps each issue from being a confusing mess is the use of title cards when there's a shift from one scene to another. Every character has a concise summary, which introduces them and their place in the story. It's exactly like an anthology title, where each ongoing serial has its own header to denote the end of one segment and the beginning of another. Not to mention, each story segment, no matter how brief, ends on a cliffhanger. It's a recurring motif that creates tension and holds an otherwise fractured story together. As for the lead character, Jack Staff is a superhero that first appeared during World War II. However, he has been around much longer than that. For some reason, he disappeared in the 70s, was forgotten by the public, and then he suddenly resurfaced in modern times. His exact origin is never fully explored, although it was finally revealed when the series rebooted as the weird world of Jack Staff. As the series reminds us, Jack Staff is also John Smith, a builder. Metaphorically, this likely indicates he is the character the premise is constructed or built around. While he may not always be a central figure, his presence alone holds the structure of the story together. The other key figure is Becky Burdock. Jack's fate seems to be intrinsically tied to hers. For practically the entire series, Becky tries to avoid Jack and the odd circumstances that seem to surround him. But no matter what, their lives continually overlap. This character trait, rejecting fate, is given an added resonance late in the series. The comic does have a touch of self-awareness, as represented by the characters, the Druid, and Rocky Reality. The Druid can see all possible realities, and he knows he's trapped in a comic book. He periodically appears to stop the reader from advancing the story forward. Naturally, he fails, and when he does, he becomes a person trapped in an asylum, being treated for delusions. Rocky Reality is a temporal reality agent who fixes comic book continuity. In one sequence, Rocky literally pulls Becky and Jack out of the panels, making them disappear from the story. He then walks them backwards through time, flipping the comic page when necessary, before inserting them back into the comic where the plot was altered. It's a segment that's on par with anything Grant Morrison did within Animal Man, except without the pretense of challenging the reader to question the nature of reality. There's also Morland the Mystic, a horoscope writer who bears a distinct resemblance to a certain popular British writer. As a curious bit of synchronicity, Morland first appears in the 10th issue of the Black and White series, and he doesn't appear again until the 10th issue of the Color series. Morland doesn't do much of anything other than reveal he knows what's about to happen. It seems to be a gentle critique of Alan Moore's writing style. Certain stories, such as Watchmen for example, read like Moore is telegraphing to the audience that he knows exactly where the plot is headed. He constantly foreshadows what he knows is coming, and withholds until the proper time. Alan Moore isn't the only British writer who makes an appearance. There's Ian M. Angel, a former comic book writer who has become a popular author of horror fiction. The name, Ian M. Angel, is an anagram for Neil Gaiman. There are many pieces of texture that fill out the history and setting of Jack Staff. Many don't seem like obvious additions to the overall plot, yet later they become relevant, or, in some cases, quite vital. For example, Linda Jones, the Calendar Girl. She is briefly introduced in issue 10 of the Black and White series. Much later, she is found dead in issue number 8 of the Color series. But she doesn't get a proper introduction until issue number 14. But her true purpose within the story isn't revealed until issue number 5 of The Weird World of Jack Staff. So, for five years, a minor background character suddenly emerges to have a pivotal role. To the best of my knowledge, the reason for her murder is never explained. Presumably, this is a story that was planned for the future. Considering her importance, it's unlikely to be an overlooked plot hole. Grist's art style is eloquent simplicity. It's stripped down to light and shadow, without a tremendous amount of rendering or detail. At the same time, it perfectly communicates the scene and the emotional quality of that scene. In the color series, the artwork was given a skillful level of depth with subtle shading. It also helps to denote mood and intent. Not to mention, it indicates different eras and different levels of reality. In some ways, Jack Staff is reminiscent of Bone. The charming, cartoonish art style offsets the darker elements of the plot. Additionally, the characters have iconic or distinct designs. There's no mistaking one character for another. This greatly diminishes any confusion one might experience concerning a deceptively complex story involving dozens of characters. A criticism one might have is the series needs to be read right from the beginning. There is a high degree of continuity and interconnectivity weaved throughout. 
While the first issue of the Color series is a solid entry point, the preceding Black and White series is where all the characters are introduced. Some details, like Becky Burdock and her transformation into a vampire, for example, aren't covered in the Color series. Admittedly, this may be a minor point, and based on my own reading experience. Personally, I began with the Black and White series, and I can't imagine what reading the Color series might be like without that prior knowledge. It's also a series best read in bulk. Due to the structure, where the focus shifts from segment to segment frequently, some storylines can be a touch confusing unless one reads through them from beginning to end in one sitting. Again, this is another minor point, but worth mentioning. Its lack of success, and obscurity, can be mainly attributed to its highly erratic publishing schedule. On average, the Color series only had three issues published per year during its eight-year lifespan. Speaking from personal experience, there were a few times a new issue would appear long after I presumed it had been cancelled. In other words, it was inconsistent and tended to disappear for months and months. Whatever audience it managed to attract slowly trickled away because its schedule was chaotic. In the end, Jack Staff is a deceptively simple series in appearance, with a rich backstory and a variety of interesting, well-developed characters. While it is a superhero story, it incorporates many different genres, creating a seamless, organic whole. It's a series that is pure story, and it's a story that's very well managed. Until next time.